Oops. Welcome to my channel so in this video, we will see what if Naruto and Elsa were couples. Read the summary given in the description. And before we start the story, if you want more amazing content like this, then be sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Now let's start the story. Laughter rang through the great hall as two young girls gleefully slid around on the icy floor. Suddenly the younger one ran to the top of one of the snow drifts that were randomly piled around and screamed, Catch me Elsa. With reckless abandon she launched herself into the air, completely trusting her sister to catch her. Elsa quickly threw her hands out shooting a spray of icy energy that formed a pile of snow just a little higher than the one her sister had jumped off of. This went on for a few more jumps each more wild than the last. Anna, slow down, Elsa pleaded. But the little girl was too caught up in the fun she was having and didn't see the trouble that Elsa was going through trying to keep up with her. Suddenly at the apex of Anna's highest jump, Elsa tripped on the hem of her nightgown and wasn't able to make a snowdrift in time. In desperation she flung a random blast of energy that instead of catching the errant girl struck her in the head. Luckily the blast threw her into one of the random piles of snow that were scattered around the floor, so she wasn't hurt by the fall, but the silence that followed was deafening. Frantically Elsa ran to her sister's side, Anna, Anna, are you okay? When no response came the young girl yelled at the top of her lungs, Mommy, Daddy, somebody help. After a few minutes of her anguished cry for help reverberating through the halls, lights began to shine in the halls, and suddenly the king and queen of the castle burst through the doors, and seeing the winter scene before them, they feared one of their secret nightmares had come true. Even though they loved both of their daughters when one of them has a power that they knew nothing about they unwillingly feared what she could do. Even if it was a complete accident it wouldn't change the damage that their daughter could cause, when she had trouble controlling her powers, and seeing their younger daughter in the arms of their crying eldest the king and queen rushed forward. The queen grabbed the limp form of Anna and began to look her over trying to see what was wrong with her baby girl, and the king grabbed Elsa and said in a worried tone, Elsa, what did you do? Filled with a child's fear that her parents would hate her, she tried to explain as fast as possible. We were playing and Anna was jumping around and I tried to catch her, but I tripped, and then, and then unable to keep going, tears began to pour from the little girl's eyes as she was overcome with worry over what would happen to her sister and herself. Seeing the distress in his daughter's eyes, the king wrapped Elsa in his arms and held her clothes making comforting noises, while his mind frantically tried to think of a way to help his girls. What if I hurt her papa? Elsa's voice was filled with sadness and fear as the words came out, does that make me a monster? The king's embrace tightened around her as he said, no darling, nothing could make you a monster. Suddenly an idea flashed through the king's head as her words brought a memory to the surface, the trolls. He said suddenly. What are you talking about Agder? The queen suddenly said from where she was holding Anna close to her chest. Instead of answering the king just said Iden, there is no time, I will have to explain on the way. Just go down to the stables and tell them to get a pair of horses ready at once, I need to go to the library to find something. When he turned around his wife hadn't moved. Reaching out he grabbed her hand and said sweetheart please go quickly and take Elsa with you, trust me. I may have thought of someone who can help our girls. The queen's eyes widened at the fact that he included Elsa in the statement, then she steeled herself and stood hefting the frame of her youngest daughter in her arms. Turning to Elsa she said in a motherly tone, Elsa run quickly to your room and find cloaks for you and your sister, then go to the stable as fast as you can, I will be there waiting for you, and as soon as your father arrives we will be off. Trusting in her parents, Elsa shot off like an arrow from a bow, moving as fast as her legs could carry her. After she was gone the queen turned her gaze to her husband and said in a quiet tone, now, the library and stable are in the same direction, so you can explain to me what you are thinking as we go. The king recognized that his wife would not negotiate on this matter and said very well, let's talk as we go, I don't know what's happened to Anna, and time is of the essence. As the horses that were carrying the royal family sped through the forest the words of her husband were bouncing around in the queen's head. Finally she could hold it and no more and called out to her husband, Agder, are you sure that they can help us, and if they can why haven't we gone to them before? Without looking over at the queen he replied, I never thought of it, because the kingdom has had no interaction with them since its founding, except for the meeting that is held every 50 years to reaffirm the treaties we have with them. Then after sighing he continued, also, I never considered them as an option because we have no guarantee that they will even agree to help us. The only reason I thought of them now is because this is an emergency and we don't really have any other choice. For the rest of the journey they were silent, each mulling over the thought of what they would do if they weren't able to find any assistance at their current destination. Finally the forest around them began to disappear, replaced by the rocky landscape that marked the domain of the rock trolls. Leaving the horses a fair distance away the small family walked into a small canyon, calling out for assistance. After a few moments the king lowered his hands from around his mouth and looked at his wife and daughters. Then in one final attempt he raised his voice please, help my daughter. She has been struck by some form of magic which I know nothing about. 
We need your help so please. When the echoes of his voice died down and still nothing had happened his shoulders slumped tiredly, and seeing the defeated look of her husband the queen nearly broke down and gave up hope for poor Anna. However right then an odd rattling could be heard throughout the canyon as the rocks that were scattered here and there began to rock back and forth. At first fearing some form of earthquake the king rushed to his family and wrapped them in a protective embrace. Suddenly the rocks around them began to stand up revealing their true form. The family gasped at the sight of the little trolls with their pointy ears and big noses. Suddenly upon closer inspection the trolls realized who exactly had entered into their domain, murmurs began to break out about the king coming to them. Finally the crowd of trolls began to part and a troll with the air of some kind of elder or leader in the tribe came forward. Your majesty, the troll gasped, what brings you to our land? Taking Anna from the arms of her mother the king bent down to show her to the troll. Please, he began, our daughter has been struck with her sister's magic and we don't know what is wrong with her. Can you help us? After inspecting the young Rititi turned to Elsa. Was she born with this ability or cursed in some way? The troll asked. Born with it. Replied the king. Turning back to Anna the troll then went on to say, well, you are lucky that it was her head that was struck. A frozen heart is nearly impossible to thaw, but the head can be persuaded. The troll then worked his magic, removing the memories of Elsa's abilities and putting everything back in its place. Then after giving his warning about the powers Elsa had been born with he looked to the king. While listening to the troll's words the king was going through an inner dialogue about how much help he should ask for form the troll people. While they did have a peaceful relationship with the trolls he knew they weren't considered citizens of his kingdom. As such he had no authority to demand their aid, but he had to do something. This accident may have been easily remedied, but how long until something worse happened because Elsa didn't have a strong hold on her abilities. He could isolate her and try to help her as best he could, but no matter how much he wanted to try to protect her from everything he knew that he had no way of knowing how to help her. So he collected his courage and looked directly at the troll. Honorable troll he began, I know, I have no right to ask anything more of you than what you have done, but please if you would I have one more favor to ask of you. The troll then turned to you the king with curiosity in his eyes. Speak king and if it is in my power to do I will do what I can to aid you. With relief the king continued, you have shown that you have knowledge of how this magic may work, and we wish to know if you can somehow help our daughter control this power that she has. Turning to look at his family he continued saying, we have been lucky that nothing has happened up till now, but as she grows so does her power, and what if next time the accident is worse. Turning back to the small elderly troll before him the king finished by pleading, please, help my daughter, so that she can become the princess that she needs to be. After hearing the king's heartfelt words the troll was troubled. In all honesty though they may be good people and good parents the king and queen knew nothing of the power of their daughter, and he suspected they would react in the predictable way of trying to seal her abilities away, by suppressing them, until the pressure they put on her both physically and emotionally, cause her to explode. He knew that he could help them, but he doubted that the tribe would agree to what they would need to do to allow the aid to be given. With a sigh the troll looked into the king's eyes and said, Your majesty, I honestly don't know if I can accomplish what you want. I will need to speak with my brethren to see if it is possible, return here in one week's time, and I will have an answer for you. Then with a bow of respect to the tall man the troll elder turned and began to leave, the rest of the trolls in the area following him deeper into the canyon. Later that evening, after the king's family had returned to their castle, the leaders of the troll clan meet together underneath the mountain. Pounding his staff on the ground to bring order to the meeting pabby, the troll king, raised his voice to begin. I have called everyone together to discuss the request that the human king put before us today. Before he could continue he was interrupted by a troll that was about a head taller than the others around the table. Abby, you can't seriously be considering it no human in this land has ever seen the extent of our kingdom. You may have allowed Bolda to keep that boy and his reindeer that she found earlier today, but even you said that she had to keep him above ground and in order to teach that girl to control her powers, we would need to bring her down here, to our true realm, to receive intensive training. After listening to the tall troll's outburst Pabby calmly replied, Brew talk, I am not proposing we teach her to fully use her abilities. Merely that we help her to gain control of it so that she wouldn't endanger those around her. When those words had been spoken another troll suddenly spoke up, Now, now Pabby, we all know that you would never let it stay at just that. You would never let a rough gem like her leave without having full control of her abilities, her powers are too great to do otherwise. After that the conversation of the council of trolls began to bounce back and forth over what they could and could not afford to teach the young girl. Finally after sitting silently and contemplating the situation, Pabby tapped his staff to the table to bring their attention back to him. I know that you are all reluctant to help her due to the need we would have of bringing her so deeply into our tribe, but what if we could help her without actually needing to train her ourselves? After stating this looks of curiosity began to be focused on the eldest troll. What are you saying Pabby? Brutok finally asked, how could we help while at the same time not help her ourselves? 
simple we send her to be with people like her who can teach her the origin of her powers and how to use them wisely, then as she grows, we can watch over her and see if she is trustworthy enough to bring her into the tribe. Pabby answered. After hearing Pabby's answer Brutok immediately responded with another question, and how, pray tell, do you plan on getting in contact with anyone from that world, we haven't had any contact with the nations since the last human we allied our tribe to betrayed us. We don't even know what is happening over there. Before he could continue Pabby interrupted him saying, and our tribe has suffered for it, we were once a great tribe seen as equals to the power of the toads, slugs, and snakes, now we are not even known. We hide here among the rocks slowly growing weaker. This girl with her power could be the key to becoming as we once were. But the sigh he continued, as for how we are going to pull this off, although many of the old treatises have faded, there is yet one ally that we can call upon to help us contact the humans of that world. Out of curiosity one of the other trolls on the council spoke, who might that be? The snakes would kill anyone from our tribe on sight, the slugs were neutral toward us in the past, we haven't heard from the toads in years, and none of the other clans like the ravens or dogs were strong enough back then for us to desire any sort of pact with them beyond one of non-aggression. Turning his gaze toward the troll who spoke Pabby answered saying, we may not have heard from them in years, but the treaty with the toads still stands, and I have a way to speak with them. At this declaration there was an atmosphere of shock throughout the chamber. Finally Brutok again spoke after so many years of indifference from them, why would they help us, we may still remember the promises that we made to them, but there is no telling if they still remember us. In exasperation Pabby said back, we have a week, let me try to contact them, and if this works then we have the solution to our problems, and if not, we will continue our talks about finding a solution. With that final declaration the meeting was adjourned, and Pabby left to seek the aid of their one-time allies. Ukasaku sat meditating under a tree, he enjoyed his peaceful time when he could practice the sage art of centering oneself, especially when he had to constantly put up with his wife's bickering, Gamma Bunta's rowdiness, and the senile old toad sage. These few times when he could get away and sit in nature were some of his favorites, but they were always interrupted after a while, which was why he wasn't surprised when Shima ran up to him croaking his name. Fuka, Fuka. She called at the top of her voice, sighing Fukasaku stood from the spot where he had been sitting and called to his wife, what is it Shima? As much as I love to hear your voice, you're croaking so low it could wake the dead. When she finally spotted him Shima frantically hopped over to him, when she was within speaking distance she gasped out, Fuka we are getting a call through the portal. Fuka raised his eyebrow at that as he responded, and what? Has Jureya gotten himself in a life or death situation again and needs our help? Why all the hurry? Fuka was confused because almost nothing excited his wife to the point that she was now. No. She replied, it's the trolls. As soon as Fuka registered what she had said his jaw dropped, they haven't tried contacting us in years he thought to himself, why now of all times, do they reach out to us again? After his mind raced through several different possible reasons, he realized that he would never know the answer by just standing there and looked to his wife who looked back at him expectantly. If I had known you would just freeze up at the news, she said, I would have just talked to them myself. Fuka deadpanned, then started to rush toward the portal, and as he passed Shima he said, alright, enough let's see what's going on. A few minutes later Fukasaku and Shima ran into the room that contained the distant body water portal together, and when Fuka looked in, he was again shocked to see the face of Pabby the leader of the trolls. That he thought I was half expecting this to either be a joke or some kind of mistake. Looking in he looked again at Pabby and smiled. Old friend, he said, where have you been? It has been at least 200 years since we last talked. Pabby looked back with a smile, 230 actually, it is good to see you again. Suddenly Shima pushed her way into the image, 230 years, and you never thought to contact us. Pabby what possessed you to cut off contact so completely? But the sigh he said when we suffered the great tragedy brought about by our last summoner, we were weakened to the point that we couldn't survive in the shinobi world anymore. That's why we cut ties with everyone. After hearing the story from Pabby, Fukasaku was saddened, he knew how loyal to their summoners the trolls were, and how they would were devastated by the betrayal they had suffered. Looking his old friend in the eyes Fuka then asked, if that is the case, then why contact us now, what can we do to help you? Abby paused then, how can I word this, he muttered, then more loudly he said, we have a new summoner. Then after thinking about it he restated, well, more like a candidate for the position. There is a young girl here with a most interesting, and powerful, ability. The only problem is that our tribe is reluctant to train her ourselves. However we know that you have some sort of connection to the ninja villages that we have heard about. Could there be a way for you to get her to be trained in one of them? Fuka was taken aback by the request that Pabby had given. Turning to Shima he asked, what do you think? Shima for her part was already evaluating what could be done. Well, she responded, the only village that I would even remotely trust is Jureya's, but we would have to talk to him about it, you know how detached we are from the other ninjas and their politics. 
Turning back to Pabby, Fuka finally said to him, we might be able to help you, but we will have to talk to our summoner first. Then his curiosity got the better of him, and he asked, oh, and out of curiosity, what is this strange ability that this girl has? Abby then had a thoughtful look on his face as he responded, I don't fully understand it, it seems like she can somehow control or even create ice and snow out of nothing. It could be that she is merely able to control the water that surrounds her in the air, but for some reason it seems like it is more to me. It truly is a puzzle. Fuka frowned thoughtfully at the answer, hmm. Turning away from the portal Fuka said to Shima, well, let's start on the summoning array to pull Jureya here, so we can talk to him about this. As Pabby turned away from the waterfall that worked as the portal of the trolls, he heaved a sigh, thank goodness they answered. It has been so long since we have used this I feared the connection had been lost. As he thought this he began walking back toward the council chamber, now he thought, I just have to wait for their answer and hope that it is a good one. I just know that if this doesn't pan out the council will be distraught. Insert line break, oh yeah, this is one of the best research sites in the entire elemental nations. Jurea said quietly to himself as he spied over the wall of the hot spring. With this kind of material I'll be able to get my next manuscript in by the end of the month. After having this monologue with himself he put all other thoughts out of his mind and focused once more on the object of his current affection and giggled perversely to himself. Everything was going well for him, his books were bestsellers, his spy network was running like a well-oiled machine, and he was free to go wherever he wanted whenever he wanted. Which was why it was such a shock when his stomach suddenly started doing somersaults and his vision was covered in smoke. Coughing and waving his hands he cleared the smoke and was surprised to see, instead of the hot spring where he had been the odd landscape of Mount Mayaboku. After registering his sudden change of location he said the first thing that came to mind, huh? Unfortunately because of the seated posture he had been in in the tree he didn't have the support he needed to stand upright, and it was at that moment that gravity decided to enforce its law, leaving him in a heap on the floor in front of a familiar elderly toad couple. Deciding that laying sprawled on the ground was a rather undignified position for a ninja of his standing, as fast as was possible for him, Jurea launched up and landed in his trademark stance, with his hands outstretched and balancing on one foot. What is the problem Fuka, are we under attack, or did you just miss my greatness so much that you couldn't resist calling me here? His statement hung in the air for a few seconds before he was suddenly struck down by the divine justice that is Shima's rolling pin. Once again sprawled on the ground he was then forced to listen to a screech of chastisement from the matronly toad, what have we told about doing that stupid pose in our house? And why would you think we would bring you here for anything as foolish as that we missed your presence, you are still 100 years too early to try impressing us. It was at that point that Fuka decided to intercede and try to save the poor sage. Now dear, I am sure he was just disoriented by the summoning, why don't you lighten up a little on the boy? Thanks for the save Fuka. Thought Jurea as tears streamed down his face from the shame of his current situation. Suddenly Jurea stood up and looked seriously at the two toads. All joking aside, he said, why have you summoned me, do you need my help with something, or do you have some kind of information that I need to know? Jurea knew that the toads wouldn't reverse summon him here, unless it was drastically important. Looking up into his eyes Fuka asked him, boy, what do you know about summon clans and how they interact? A look of confusion suddenly came over Jurea's face as he pondered the question, finally he answered. To be honest not much. I know that Gamma Bunta is at least acquainted with the boss summons of the snakes and the slugs. But I had always figured he met them through me and my teammates. Nodding his head at the answer Fuka began his lecture, very good, but you are wrong. The toads, snakes and slugs have been dealing with each other for centuries, long before we ever even had summoners or any dealings with humans, and more than them there are many other animal nations, some that humans have yet to discover, and some that humans have all but forgotten. After saying all this he looked to Jurea to see his reaction to the information. Jurea for his part was surprised by this revelation, but after considering it for a while, he decided that it made sense that a sentient race of animals would have their own dealings and politics like humans did, so in order to keep the information coming Jurea posed a question. Okay, so how does this new information tie into me being summoned today? Fuka smiled when he heard Jurea's question, happy that he had been insightful enough to ask the right one. Well, Fuka continued, earlier today we were contacted by another one of these nations, one who have been our allies for longer than I care to remember, but had centuries ago cut ties with the shinobi nations and have since faded into obscurity. They have asked for our aid and in order to give them what they need we needed to contact you. With this added information Jurea was even more curious about this, what could the toads need with me? He thought, they are completely autonomous, the only thing I do for them is be their link to Kanoha. And as soon as that thought went through his head he realized that that was exactly the reason they needed him, after reaching this conclusion he tested it by saying to Fuka, and how can I help you, the only thing I am for you is a link to the ninja villages, so unless it has something to do with it I can't do much. 
As soon as the words left his mouth Jiraiya and Fuka knew that they were on the same page. Fuka's smile widened, exactly Jiraiya, there might be hope for you yet. Yes this nation has finally found someone that they see as worthy to be their summoner. The only problem is that it is a young girl who needs training, and they don't feel that they could train her due to some outside circumstances. And before you ask no they didn't give me all of the information, we are allies not one nation, and as such we are all entitled to our little secrets. Now on to the central question, do you think that this girl could be accepted in Konoha and receive training to become a summoner that this clan could trust? As he listened to what Fuka had been saying, Jiraiya began to rub his chin in thought as he considered the possibilities. It could work, but before I would be willing to bring anyone into Konoha's gates, I would have to meet them and discern if they pose some sort of threat to the village. Fuka nodded again when he heard Jiraiya's response. I understand, and we also would hate any harm to come to that village by our folly. I will tell this to our allies, and we will see if we can arrange a meeting. You can wait here on the mountain until we receive the response. As he turned to leave however Jiraiya raised his hand to ask one more question, wait, you never said who your allies were that had contacted you. Oh, responded Fuka, I am sorry for my slip up. They are the trolls. And with that response Fuka disappeared in a body flicker, leaving Jiraiya with a confused look on his face thinking, what's a troll? Over the past week the King of Arendelle had been distraught with worry about what the future might hold for his family. The morning after their trip to the trolls for help Anna had stayed asleep, at first they were worried that perhaps the trolls had been too late to help, but later she began to stir, and shortly after that she awoke from her short coma. After a brief period of bed rest, a mere day and a half, she had been up and around with the same energy and fervor that she possessed before the accident. The real stress in his life had been Elsa. She seemed afraid to touch anyone in the family anymore. She stayed by herself in her room sealed off from human contact. When the king and queen went to speak to her, when Anna had come crying into their room about how mean Elsa was being, she had refused to touch or even come close to them, going so far as to put a pair of stockings on her hands, so that there was no chance her skin would come in contact with someone else's. She no longer played with her sister, she wouldn't hug them goodnight, just about the only time they saw her was at meal times, where they had to order her to come, and she would eat in silence and excuse herself as quickly as she possibly could. Finally the king had felt that her behavior had gone on long enough, and he called her into his office to speak to her alone. They had sat there awkwardly side by side until the king finally asked, Elsa, what is the matter? Why have you decided to cut yourself off from the rest of us? Getting up he kneeled in front of her chair, so that he could look her straight in the eye, your mother, sister, and I are worried about you, we love you and want to help. After a while Elsa's eyes started to shine with tears, as she began to break down and cry out, I'm a monster I, I almost killed Anna, and I don't want to hurt anyone else. When she finished her exclamation of the guilt she felt she began to sob in earnest. The king rushed forward and took her in a strong embrace. Oh Elsa, he said in the most gentle voice he could, you are not a monster. What happened with Anna was a complete accident. You would never hurt her or anyone on purpose right? Elsa shook her head furiously into her father's shoulder as she continued to cry. That's right, the king continued, we know that you are still learning to control your abilities, they don't make you a monster, they make you special. When you learn to control them I am sure there are endless possible ways that you can use them to help others. That is why we asked the trolls for help when we went to visit them. They know how to teach you to control your abilities, and with their help, you will never have to fear hurting someone else ever again okay. Pulling his head back the king looked into his daughter's eyes, they looked less sad, but there was still a small light of uncertainty in them. But, what if the trolls can't help, or what if they want? She asked. Looking at her with determined look he responded, Elsa, if the trolls can't help you then I will not rest until I have found someone who can. Nothing will stop me from making sure you never have to fear what you can do again, understood. And with that fatherly declaration the last strings of doubt on Elsa's heart broke, and she hugged her father even tighter saying, thank you daddy. With his daughter's faith in him restored he pushed her back a little, so that she stood at arm's length and said to her alright, now that we have that taken care of. Let's talk about the stockings you have on your hands. He said with a serious face, which was ruined by the slight smile he wore. Elsa looked at her covered hands before she clutched them to her chest. Daddy, please don't make me stop wearing them. I feel like I have more control with them on. As she said it she looked up at him with wide pleading eyes. Seeing his daughter's pitiful look he went around to behind his desk and opened a drawer pulling out a small pair of white gloves. Fine, he said, I won't make you stop covering your hands, but stockings are not a hand covering fit for a princess. So how about you use these instead? Once more he knelt down to his daughter's level and gently removed the stockings before replacing them with the elegant gloves. The small girl gasped as she looked at the gloves before hugging her father again in gratitude. But that last problem seemingly fixed he took her to bed and left her whispering, Now I know of a little girl who would love to spend some time with you tomorrow. Motioning over toward Anna sleeping on the other side of the room. He then kissed her forehead and left for his own bed. 
Few days had passed since their talk, and Elsa was beginning to act more like her old self again. She was still a little careful around Anna, and she seemed fearful of accidentally letting her powers out, but it was a large improvement from the recluse that she had been for the past couple of days. The problem he faced now was that it was a mere two days until the proposed meeting with the trolls had been set, and some of the fears that Elsa had conveyed were taking up root in his own heart. What if the trolls couldn't or wouldn't help Elsa? He had promised his little girl that he would do everything in his power to help her, but what if it was completely out of his power to do so? For the last day and a half these thoughts had plagued his mind, but at that moment all he could do was shake them from his mind and worry about them after he found the outcome to the meeting he was going to now. Anna stayed behind with her mother because she had forgotten everything about Elsa's abilities, so it was just the king and Elsa who climbed together onto a horse to hear the answer to their request for help. As they rode out of the city the last thought the king had was, please let them be able to help. They may be my only hope. Elsa and the king walked quietly into the small canyon where they had met the trolls during their last visit. The horse they had rode in on was tied a little ways off munching on grass as the father and daughter went to hear what the trolls had to say about Elsa's future. When they reached the place where they had last spoken with the troll king the week prior the king called out, Honorable troll, we have returned after a week just as you said. Please, give us your answer. Will you help my daughter to learn to control her powers or not? They waited patiently for a few minutes before once again a rumbling was heard as rocks around the area began to shake and roll around until one particular rock rolled up to the pair of royals and stood to reveal itself as the troll they had come to speak with. Stretching up he reached his full diminutive height before saying to the king in a solemn voice, We cannot do what you ask noble king W. The king immediately interrupted the troll, his eyes wide with shock before narrowing slightly in desperate anger. Why not? He demanded, you obviously have a grasp of magic and its inner workings, what is keeping you from aiding my daughter? After hearing the words of the troll and her father's sudden thunderous reply, Elsa cowered behind the king's leg. Seeing the response of the king and his daughter, the troll raised his hand in a placating manner before continuing, Peace, King Agder. I said that we couldn't help you daughter, but we can get you the assistance that you ask for. When he said this the king immediately calmed down and his eyes showed hope, marvelous, he said, but I am confused, how can you offer any assistance when you say that you can't help her? That is where I come in. A voice suddenly said from behind the king. Turning around he beheld a very odd sight unlike anything he had seen before. Standing behind him was a tall man in his mid to late forties, wearing a strange green outfit of a style he was not familiar with, the pants were long, but they were tucked into some kind of mesh shin guards that stopped above his ankles, showing off the wooden sandals he was wearing that had him standing on two thin platforms. On his upper body he wore some kind of inner coat over a shirt that seemed to be made of a material similar to the shin protectors. The sleeves of the coat were also tucked into bracers made of the same mesh that had some kind of protector for the back of his hand. Over everything the man wore a long red overcoat that had no sleeves and two yellow dots over his chest. The man's long spiky white hair was held back out of his face by a horned headband with some kind of black marking in the middle of his forehead. At the sight of this new stranger the king took a step back in surprise and pushed Elsa behind himself so that he was between her and the strange man. Hello, greeted the stranger, my name is the great Jurea of Kanahagakur. He ended his introduction with a large smile and a thumbs up. The king wasn't sure how to respond, and he was even more confused when a small green blur seemed to leap up and strike Jiraiya over the head, making him duck and grab his head with a hiss of pain. The blur it turned out was a toad that stood a few inches shorter and was many inches thinner than the troll that they had been talking to. The weird thing about it thought wasn't its eyes, but the way that it had eyebrows, hair, and a goatee, toads do not normally have hair on them. Nor do they talk, but this one did as it waved its cane threateningly at the tall man. Gureya, you fool, we are trying to get the king here to trust us, not scare the living daylights out of him and his daughter. Sighing the toad turned to the king, forgive him, he always has had a problem with taking things seriously. My name is Fukasaku, and before you say it yes I am a talking toad, and I am an ally to the troll tribe that you are familiar with. When he finished his introduction the king had to take a moment to collect his thoughts, before the overload of information caused him to faint. Looking down at Elsa, he saw that her eyes were the size of dinner plates and glued to the side of the talking toad. Having marshaled his emotions enough, the king looked back to the toad who had moved to stand by the troll elder, and they seemed to be greeting each other as they waited for him to regain his bearings. And how Sir Frog can you and your companion aid my family as he seems to claim? The king asked trying to be polite as he was surrounded by all of these oddities, while on the inside he was thinking if I pick up Elsa and run we should be able to get away, and I can forget any of this ever happened. Turning back to the king the toad said, first thing, please refrain from confusing me with a frog, I am a toad and we are very sensitive about this distinction. Now to answer your question. We hail from a far away land where abilities such as your daughters are commonplace, we can take her there where she will be trained on how to control her abilities. 
The look of doubt came over the king's face at hearing about an entire land with people that had abilities like his daughter. Upon seeing the doubt Jurea stepped forward saying, perhaps a demonstration would help to ease your mind. Spreading his arms out he said you might want to stand back for this. Giving those present some time to retreat a few steps he brought his hands together making four separate shapes with his fingers after the last, he slapped his hand on the ground while saying, earth release. Earth style wall. Suddenly there was a thunderous rumbling and behind Jurea, a large wall of rock began to rise from the ground, as it rose upon the wall the shape of a toad could be seen sitting with its hands together in a meditative posture. When the wall stopped forming Jurea straightened himself and shifted his shoulders to settle his coat back to its proper place, before looking back at the king, a slight smirk formed on his face when he took in the shocked expression on the two royals' faces. Making a grand gesture toward the wall he had just constructed he said, As you can see, abilities to control the elements are not such an oddity where I come from. Your daughter will fit right in, and I am sure we can solve any kind of control problem she may have. When he had witnessed the monumental feat showed to him hope began to stir in the king's chest. If this man can do that he thought then training Elsa should be child's play for him. Focusing back on the troll, the toad, and the man before him he enthusiastically said, This is perfect, you can act as Elsa's tutor and help her to learn to control her abilities. When he heard the king's response however Jurea's face sunk in a frown, Sorry your majesty, he said, I can't do that. The king was shocked, and he quickly tried to explain more about the position. No, you needn't worry about lodging or food, you will live in the castle with us and be free to come and go whenever you please. But his remarks were cut off by the raising of Jurea's hand, it's not a matter of my upkeep, it is a matter of my responsibilities. I am not some wandering magician looking for his next meal, I am very loyal to my homeland and have certain obligations that must be met, so I can't afford to spend the years it would take to train her completely. Instead I can offer her a place in an academy for children like her, who have similar abilities where she will learn and develop her control. At the mention of years being spent away from home the king visibly stiffened. He looked at the man incredulously saying, You are telling me that I have to send my daughter, a princess of my kingdom, and my heir, out to some place I have never heard of, with a man I have just met. You must think me mad to take such a risk. King Agder, the troll said, having decided to re-enter the conversation at this point, you will not lose complete contact with your daughter. We have a way to travel quickly between this land and the other, meaning you will be able to hear from her frequently. Also I must add that the toads have been our allies and friends for centuries. We have complete trust in them when they say no harm will come to your daughter, she will only receive the help that she needs. The king looked intently at the three who were trying to convince him to take this option, searching for any inkling that they were trying to deceive him, finally after seeing nothing dishonest about what they had said he looked down at his daughter. Elsa for her part had been avidly watching the entire conversation unfold, knowing that what was being said here would direct the course of her future. She had originally thought that the man with white hair was kind of scary, but he almost seemed too playful to stay scary for long. However when she saw him make the earth wall seemingly out of nothing and heard about an academy where she could learn to do things like that with other kids like her, she was shocked to complete silence. Thoughts were going through her mind at a million miles per hour, saying things like I could learn to do things like that. Or I wonder if I could make friends with other people like me. When the talking had suddenly stopped and she looked to her father, she saw that he was looking at her with a puzzled face, like he didn't know what to do about this. When she saw it she simply smiled at him, because she would be happy for the opportunity that they were describing. After a while of studying his daughter, with an intensity as if he were trying to memorize everything about her, he stated, and I have a while to think about it and to also speak with my wife concerning our decision. Rubbing his chin thoughtfully Jurea said, well that depends, how old is your daughter? Wanting to at least have said one thing in all the talking that was happening that night, Elsa jumped at the chance to answer this simple question. I am seven, sir she said meekly, before retreating again behind her father's leg. Well that's perfect then. Responded Jurea, the academy of which I speak doesn't let children in until the age of eight. So you have plenty of time to talk it over, and if you decide to send her then you will also have some time to teach her to read our language. A little offended at the remark the king retorted, she has learned to read and write from tutors since the age of five. Realizing his mistake Jurea helped out his hands in a placating gesture. Sorry, sorry, he said, I should have said my language. We are able to speak to each other thanks to the trolls and their techniques, but we still have different languages. For example can you read this? He said, as he pointed to his forehead. With confusion the king looked closer at the mark on Jurea's forehead. No, he answered truthfully, I had assumed it was a mark denoting rank or something along those lines. With a chuckle Jurea shook his head and said, Nope, this is the word for oil in my language, so if you want her to be able to do well at the academy, she is going to have to learn to read and write in this language. At that the troll elder spoke up, However, you won't have to worry about that. That is something we can help her with if you make the decision to send her to the academy. 
With a sigh of exhaustion the king said, Very well, I will talk to my wife and return with our answer to this in two days. And even though we may not accept the aid you have offered us, I do want to thank you for offering it. It was an honor, your majesty. The three replied. And with that the talks had ended for the evening, and the king and Elsa went home. They want what? Screamed the queen, as she paced back and forth in their private quarters. You are telling me that they want me to send Elsa off to some far-off land that we have never heard of, so that she can learn to use her powers. Whirling about so that she faced the king directly she said to him, I would rather take the chance of teaching her myself than be separated from her in that manner. Looking at his wife the king rebutted, yes but we can't teach her ourselves Iden. These people have the same powers as her, and we wouldn't have to worry at all about someone getting hurt while she is learning. In an attempt to calm his wife down he grabbed her hands in his own. And, he continued, we wouldn't be completely losing contact with her, we would be able to write letters and hear how she is progressing. Think of it like a boarding school. Sighing the queen looked into the king's eyes and said, but Agder, she is so young. To send her away for four years would be too much. By the time she got back she would already be a young woman. And how are we going to explain it to Anna, she has forgotten all about Elsa's power, so she wouldn't understand why her sister is going away. Pulling his wife into an embrace the king said, I am sure we will think of something. Tomorrow we will discuss it together as a family, and we will see what Elsa wants to do. Elsa for her part was almost too excited to sleep. There are people like me. She thought, as she laid down after getting ready for bed. I won't be alone, and I won't have to be afraid of hurting anyone accidentally, ever again. I sure hope mom and dad let me go. The next morning Elsa was woken up by the little red-headed ball of energy that was her sister Anna. Hey, Anna said excitedly, where did daddy and you go last night? I wanted to go too, but mom wouldn't let me. The last part was said with a cute pout on her face. Elsa however didn't notice the pout because she was too busy panicking. She didn't want to lie to her sister, but Anna didn't know about her powers, or the trolls. Luckily Elsa was saved when the butler, Kai, entered their room. Respectfully bowing before the two young princesses he said, Girls, you parents would like you to join them for breakfast now. They said that there was an urgent matter to discuss as a family. Bouncing up from her sister's bed, Anna hurriedly began to get dressed. Oh, 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 she said as she threw of her nightgown and began to scramble into a dress, I wonder what they want to talk to us about, I wonder if we are going to go on a trip together. Moving at a more sedate pace Elsa began to prepare herself as well, her ideas however stayed in her mind instead of spilling out, it is probably about what daddy spoke to the trolls about. I wonder if they will let me go to the academy. When the two girls had finished getting ready, Kai led them to the small dining room that was reserved for family meals between the royals. After they finished eating together the small family gathered in the parents' personal sitting room to talk. The king spoke first saying, now girls we wanted to talk to you two about something very important. Before he continued Anna, ever the unstoppable ball of energy, blurted out, is this about what you went out with Elsa to do last night? The king looked at his youngest and chuckled lightly, yes Anna, it has something to do with that. Your sister is special, and as such she has been invited to go to a special school to learn how to be he paused here, as if trying to think of how to phrase it to his daughter. She is going to learn how to better fulfill her future responsibilities. The queen suddenly said, filling in for her husband's lack of imagination. Anna just sat there looking at them with a confused look on her face. So what does that mean? The little girl asked innocently. It means that if we decide to send her there, she will have to go away for a few years. The king responded. Shock suddenly filled the little girl's face, and her eyes began to shine with tears, she then grabbed her sister tightly and said forcefully, no. You can't send her away, she needs to stay with me. Elsa for her part was taken aback by her sister's response to the news, and she didn't know how to respond. Before she could however their mother suddenly said, oh, we know honey. As she said this she stood and moved to the two girls, that is why we are talking together now. We would never send your sister away without talking to you two about it. And with that the queen looked to her husband as if to say I guess we aren't sending her. When Elsa saw that look however in a sudden moment of insight she knew that her parents were going to listen to Anna and not send her with the white-haired man they met the night before. Suddenly, unbidden, the fears that had grown from the accident with her sister came back full force. What if I never learned to control my power? What if I hurt one of my family? With all of the strength she could muster, she tore herself from the grasp of her sister and launched from her seat to stand opposite her entire family. Then with her whole being she stated, I want to go. Her family's eye widened at her declaration. Stepping forward her father said, Elsa, please think about this, you would be away for so long. Giving her father a determined look Elsa retorted, but I want to go. If I don't I won't be able to be a good princess like you said. Then turning to her mother she said in her most pleading voice, please mother, I have to go. I will be with other people like me. 
Suddenly two little arms latched around her neck yet again, and she heard Anna almost wail in her ear. No, we just started playing together again you can't leave now. Elsa did feel bad for having to leave her sister, but deep down she still felt fear worming its way into her heart. Every time they were together she felt like she would lose control. She felt like she had to go if she were ever going to be able to truly be with her family again. She tried to gently move her sister's arm so she could talk to her as she said. Anna listened before she was interrupted and her sister held on tighter. No you can't go. With that she started to get frustrated because she couldn't breathe easily due to the tightness of her sister's arms, and Anna wasn't letting her explain. Roughly now she jerked her sister's arms away and whirled to face her before she said sternly. Listen Anna, I am going to go and you can't stop me. Anna just looked at Elsa shocked by how her sister had treated her before she got up and ran from the room. Elsa then turned toward her parents who both looked taken aback by the way their daughter was acting. The queen then said to her, Elsa that was not good. How could you treat your sister that way? When she heard her Elsa looked at her parents with a frustrated expression. She wouldn't let me explain, she said loudly, and you two were just going to listen to her whining, instead of asking me what I wanted to do. This is about me, it's my problem and I want to go. After listening to her the king and queen felt slightly ashamed at what she had said, because she had hit the nail squarely on the head. After a few moments of thought the king looked up and said, Very well if this is what you truly want we can't stop you. We will go visit them tomorrow and tell them your decision. When he said this Elsa ran to him with a hug and thanked him. Now, said the king, you need to go find your sister and apologize, understood. Yes, father replied Elsa, before she turned and began to leave. After the door had shut the queen turned to the king and said, Are you sure about this? No, the king replied, but it seems to be the only choice that we have. When she got to the room that she shared with her sister Elsa was a bit nervous, I really was mean to her she thought as she slowly reached for the doorknob, I just hope I can explain it well. Then without further delay she swung the door open and stepped inside. She scanned the room until her eyes finally rested on the small lump in the covers of her sister's bed. Slowly she crept up to it and said softly, Anna, Anna are you awake? No response was given, so she sighed and said, Anna, I am sorry for yelling at you, but I really want to go, I can't tell you why, but just know that it is important to me. After that was said she turned back to her own bed and started to walk until she heard rustling behind her and her sister's voice say, Why can't you tell me? Turning quickly Elsa's eyes widened to see her sister awake and staring at her angrily. I, I see can't, she stammered out, trying to think of a good excuse, because, daddy told me not to tell anyone. She finally settled on blaming her parents, hoping that it would redirect her sister's ire on them. Unfortunately for her it did no such thing, her sister just pointed at her and said, it never stopped us from sharing secrets before. This is different, Elsa retorted, it is dangerous, that's why I need to go. Liar, Anna yelled back, you just don't want to stay with me because you think I whine too much. Elsa could only look at her with a questioning look not sure what she was talking about. I heard when you were talking to mom and dad. I heard that you think I was just whining to keep you here. Anna continued, well I don't even care if you go anymore, in fact I hope trolls come and take you away right now. Then with that final outburst Anna grabbed her covers and laid back down. Fine, Elsa shouted back before she jumped on her bed and buried her head into the pillow. Neither of them noticed the tears leaking from the other's eyes. The next two weeks seemed to flash by, they had talked to the trolls and told them their decision, and had again spoken to the man, Jiraiya, to make plans on what they would do with their daughter. Elsa's eighth birthday was only nine weeks away so during that time a troll would stay at the castle and have lessons with Elsa to teach her how to read the new language she would be learning. Speaking it could be taken care of with the troll's skills, but learning to read and write it would be a different matter entirely. Luckily the girl was an attentive student and took to the lessons like a fish to water. Unfortunately the relationship between the sisters did not improve. A few days after the first spat Anna requested to have her own room. When her parents asked her why she wouldn't want to spend the rest of the time before her sister left sharing she said it was so that she could get used to sleeping alone. Meal times with the family were quiet and awkward and no amount of peacemaking that the parents tried would reconcile the two. Finally when Elsa's birthday came the king and queen organized a grand party opening the gates to any and all that wished to attend. Elsa enjoyed it immensely, but there was one thing missing. Anna had come for a short time, but left as soon as she was allowed. That night the sisters met in the hall, Elsa looked to her sister with pleading eyes and said, Anna, I am sorry for everything. Please I don't want to leave with you mad at me. Anna just looked at her sadly and said, then don't leave, stay here. I can't do that. Elsa responded, I need to go to the academy it is important. Anna then began to fight back tears as her face filled with anger. Right she said, because you have this big secret that you can't tell me. Fine then go to your academy and do what you need to do but don't expect me to be happy about it. And with that Anna stormed to her room and slammed the door. Two days later Elsa left. Her stomach was sick with nervousness as Elsa rode with the king to the Trolls Canyon. 
This morning she had hugged her mother goodbye with tears in her eyes, Anna however had refused to leave her room. When they arrived the trolls were waiting for them along with Jureya and Fukasaku the toad. Greetings, you majesty. Jureya said jovially as they dismounted, glad you could make it. The king merely looked at him before sighing out a reply, thank you for the warm welcome and sorry if I don't share your mood, but I am going to be saying goodbye to my daughter for a long time today, so I don't feel very happy. Hearing her father's reply Elsa frowned until she hugged his legs and looked up at him saying, don't worry daddy, I will be fine and when I come back we will all be together again. The king just looked down at her as he tried to hold back the tears. Just stay safe. He said as he knelt down to take her in his arms and make sure you come home as soon as you can. Don't worry, they both turned to face Jureya when they heard his voice, I give you my word as the great Jureya that no harm will come to your daughter while she is in my village. He ended the statement with a thumbs up and a smile. Standing again the king said, I will hold you to that. And he extended his hand to the odd man that he would be entrusting his daughter to. But Pabby, the troll king, suddenly interjected, now Jureya if you will take the girl to the circle. He then pointed to a circle of stones, you can both be on your way, the sooner she goes the sooner she gets back, and you don't want them to get stuck on the road at night time, it doesn't look like your daughter packed for a long road trip. As he finished he pointed to the pack on Elsa's back. Oh, I almost forgot. The king suddenly said we need to bring the rest of her luggage from the wagon. Leading the others behind him he led them to a simple wagon which held two large trunks. We didn't know for sure what she would need, so we packed her some basic essentials and a purse of gold so that she can get started. Ureya and the two summons could only sweat drop when they saw what the king considered basic essentials, and their eyes nearly jumped from their skulls at the size of the purse of gold. It would more accurately be described as a large bag of gold. Looking back to the man who would be escorting his daughter the king then asked. Do you have animals or a wagon for transport? Jureya just smirked and said, don't worry I can carry all of this. The king gave the man a disbelieving look and skeptically responded, I assure you sir that these trunks are full and quite heavy. Don't worry, rebutted Jureya, just step back and I will show you another interesting skill. So the king and Elsa stepped back while Jureya unrolled a scroll on the ground and began to write on it with short quick brush strokes. A few minutes later he walked to the wagon and grabbed the two trunks. While he may not have the colossal strength of his teammate, he did have the ability to enhance his strength. So it was with deceptive ease that he lifted both trunks and placed them on the scroll, followed by the sack of gold. Turning back to the two royals he was pleased by the gobsmacked expression they wore, after all they had seen a pair of their strongest servants struggle under the same weight. Then he said to them, now prepare for the actual trick. Suddenly he bent down laid his hands on the writing that peeked out from under the load and said seal. In a puff of smoke the mass of luggage disappeared before their very eyes. As the king stood there shocked at the seemingly impossible feat, and Elsa began to wonder if she could learn to do that. The two wise and summons merely rolled their eyes before Pabby said, All right now that we have that figured out it is time for them to depart. After the troll had finished Jurea motioned with his hands and said, This way my dear. Hesitantly Elsa followed him to the circle of stones and turned to face her father one last time. As the old toad and troll approached the circle she suddenly called out, Goodbye Papa, tell Mama and Anna that I love them and I will write you as soon as I can. And with that there was a large poof of smoke and she was gone. After the smoke cleared the two old beings turned to the king. In a last attempt at giving him some consolation the toad said, Don't worry your majesty she is in good hands. I have known Jureya since he was a boy and though at times he seems immature, he is one of the most reliable men I have ever had the honor to call my friend. Turning to the little creature the king said, Thank you for your words. Now if you will excuse me I have a kingdom to see to and another daughter as well. With that he squared his shoulders, got on his wagon, and began the ride back to the city, all the while thinking please be safe Elsa. Elsa coughed and waved her hand in front of her face to clear the smoke when she could see again, her eyes widened at the size of the trees that surrounded her. She stood in the middle of a small path in the middle of the biggest forest she had ever laid eyes on. Finally her gaze settled on the form of Jureya watching her with amusement. When he saw that she had stopped gawking he said with a chuckle, well how do you feel? The first time most people travel this way they get a little queasy. After he said that Elsa suddenly was overcome with a sense of vertigo that she hadn't noticed due to being overwhelmed by her surroundings. Grabbing her stomach she leaned over and groaned due to the feeling. Jurea just rubbed her back to soothe her and said, don't worry, it will pass soon enough. After looking around a bit Jurea smiled as he recognized where they were. All right, we are about 30 minutes from the village if we walk at your speed, or he finished cryptically. Or what? Elsa replied, giving in to her curiosity. Or, Jurea continued, I could give you a taste of the kinds of things you will be learning, and we could get there in five minutes. Elsa looked at him in awe wondering what he could do to cut that much time of their trip. Finally after deliberating for a while she said, fine, what is the faster way? Two minutes later Elsa was screaming with glee while she clung to Jurea's neck. 
It was almost like they were flying, and he hopped from tree to tree through the woods. This is amazing. She yelled at the top of her lungs. Jiraiya smiled to himself as he witnessed the joy Elsa found in simple tree jumping. A few minutes later he landed in the middle of a wide road. Jiraiya gently helped Elsa down to the road, which almost caused her to pout that they had stopped. Why have we stopped? She asked, as she looked up at him. Because we are here. Jiraiya responded making a grand displaying motion with his hands, as he gestured to the large gates that were behind him, which was why she hadn't seen them right away. She gasped as she took in the sight of the big red gate that had an enormous symbol above it that she recognized as meaning fire. Welcome, Jiraiya said grandly, to Kanahagakur. Elsa couldn't keep her eyes on just one thing as she followed Jiraiya through the street. Everything was so different here than at home. The buildings were all so close together and square with the occasional odd-shaped roof here and there. The people went to and fro, all of them seeming so peaceful, dressed in the oddest clothing she had ever seen from pants and shirts to dresses and kimonos. Every so often as she was looking up she would catch glimpses of people leaping from rooftop to rooftop, just like how she had when Jiraiya was carrying her through the woods. But most of all the thing that made her eyes go huge was the mountain at the back of the city, with the four faces that seemed to watch over the city as silent sentinels. When she could hold her curiosity and no more she gave a small tug on the toad sage's sleeve. Um, Mr. Jiraiya, who are those four people on the mountain? She asked timidly pointing toward the monument. Looking at where she was pointing Jiraiya smiled as he answered, those, young lady are the faces of the leaders of our village. We put their faces up as a reminder of the greatest men in the village, so that we will have a standard to strive for. His tone suddenly turned more prideful as he continued. In fact I myself was taught personally by the man whose face is third from the left, he puffed out his chest as he said the next line, and I was also the teacher to the man whose face sits farthest to the right. Elsa looked up at the man who obviously took great pride in those two facts, but something confused her about it. But, if you were taught by the third man, and trained the fourth, why didn't your face get put up there? Were you not good enough? She asked in childish innocence, causing a tick mark to form on his head in irritation. No, he responded, it is not because I wasn't good enough. It is because I have other responsibilities in the village that only I can do. Really? Elsa said back, like what? Leaning down, to look her in the eye, Jiraiya said sternly, they are top secret, and therefore not something I can freely tell you because you are too young. Elsa just pouted at his comeback not liking being treated like a child, even though she happened to be one. Suddenly the little spat the child and white-haired man were having was interrupted when there was an indignant shout behind them. You little brat. They heard which caused them to turn around to see a man who seemed to have just exited a store being pelted in the face by water balloons filled with various bright colored paints, leaving him covered in a tie-dye pattern. Suddenly they heard laughing, and their vision shifted to the awning of the store across the way from the one that the man had just come out of. Standing there was a young boy of about eight years of age, with bright golden blonde hair. He was wearing orange shorts with a white shirt that had a red flame-like pattern on the front and blue sandals. Putting his hands on his hips he proudly proclaimed, you should feel honored, you just got pranked by the future Hokage and current prank king of Kanoha. You're right. The painted man responded pointing at the boy, as if you would ever be chosen as Hokage, you are nothing but a menace. Instead of responding to the jab the boy's smile just widened until his eyes were scrunched up in the corners, before quick as lightning his hand flashed forward, and he launched four eggs at the man. When they struck instead of being covered in more goo like he expected the eggshells exploded in a cloud of flour and glitter, making his condition more noticeable due to the sparkles that now covered him. Then with the attack completed the boy slammed his foot down and yelled, I am going to be Hokage, and there is nothing you can do about it, Dadabeo. After the boy's little rant was done the now painted and sparkly man grit his teeth and seemed like he was going to yell back before he stopped and just smirked at the boy. Confused by the unexpected response the boy looked behind himself to see two Chunin standing behind him with rather unpleasant smiles on their faces. Well would you look at this. One of them said, we've got ourselves a little troublemaker disrupting the peace of our fair village. Indeed, agreed his companion, let's see what the Hokage has to say to this little terror shall we. The smiles on their faces turned to smirks as they watched the boy who seemed to be frozen in fear. Expecting this to be an easy catch one of the ninjas started to reach toward the boy, neither of them noticing Jiraiya starting to tense up and subconsciously reach for his kunai pouch, when suddenly the boy's smile returned as he exploded into motion. In under a second he zipped between the two ninja and pulled out two more eggs. He then leapt up so that he was level with their faces, so that when they turned around they were both met with a face full of yolk, these eggs not having their insides replaced like the ones before. As if you two could catch me. The boy said cockily before he leaped down to the road and took off like a bullet running through the crowd as fast as he could. Elsa, after the whole ordeal, was just staring slack-jawed at the retreating form of the boy. 
Turning to her guide she saw that he was watching the boy as he faded into the crowd with a look that she couldn't quite identify. It seemed like it was a mixture of pride, sorrow and shock. Do you know that boy? Elsa asked Jurea curious about his strange reaction. Jurea's head whirled around when she asked the question before he smiled at her and replied with what seemed to be a hint of sadness. No, no I don't. A few minutes later Elsa found herself sitting in a small waiting area outside the office of the leader of the village. Jurea had left her there while he went in to explain the situation and told her that she would be called in afterward. Inside the office Jurea was leaning against a wall across the desk from his old sensei. So Jurea began the old ninja, from the message you sent before you arrived, I was able to discern what you are doing here, but I would like to hear it from your own mouth to make sure I understand completely. Being the spy master of Konoha meant that every message the Hokage received from him was in some sort of code and written to be intentionally vague. Jurea smiled and looked at his old mentor. Tell me sensei do you know what a troll is? He asked cryptically. He almost burst into laughter at the dumbfounded expression that was on the older man's face. What are you talking about? The Hokage asked puzzled at what his student had said. Jurea continued saying well apparently at one time there was an old clan of summons who were allied to the toads. These creatures were called trolls and at one time were considered one of the strongest summon contracts. Jurea paused as he remembered the story that the two old toads, Fuka and Shima, had told him. Unfortunately the contract was lost at some time early in the clan wars era when due to a mistake by their summoner, they suffered heavy losses, driving them to near extinction. As such they left the shinobi world behind and traveled to some far off land to live their lives in peace. Well this is a very interesting history lesson Jiraiya, unless you are here to drop off the summon scroll for this ancient clan, I don't see what it has to do with your visit. The Hokage said tiredly thinking of the time this meeting was adding to how long it would take for him to finish the day's paperwork. Well, continued Jiraiya, in this far off land it appears that chakra doesn't exist, or at least the people there were never taught how to harness it. Thus when the trolls were discovered by the citizens of this other continent, they were thought to have magic of some sort, due to their limited knowledge of chakra. Jiraiya. The Hokage barked, I know that as a writer you enjoy spinning stories for your audience, but as you can see, as he said this he gestured to the piles of paper on his desk, I am extremely busy with the elements of running a village. So if you don't mind I would really appreciate it if you got to the point. The Hokage enjoyed the time he got to spend with his old students, he really did, but sometimes if Urea's reasons for coming weren't life-threatening, he would drag the meetings on and on, until he wasted half of the day. Fine, fine gosh you have gotten really grumpy as you have aged you crotchety old man. Jurea said with the ghost of a pout forming on his face. He enjoyed spinning his stories when he had the opportunity. It seemed that nowadays he only ever got to give reports that were matters of life or death that needed to be communicated as concisely as possible. Turning away from the desk he opened the door and stuck his head out into the hallway. The Hokage could hear his muffled call to someone then after a short wait, Jiraiya opened the door wider and in walked a little girl. If the Hokage didn't know any better he would have mistaken her for a member of the Yamanaka clan by the way she looked, but on closer inspection he saw the differences. There were no members of that clan had hair so shockingly light in the correct lighting, he was sure that it would look icy white and her eyes were such a bright blue that they seemed to glow. She walked in with her head slightly bowed, obviously nervous about being in a strange new place. As she entered the office and looked around her eyes focused finally on the old man seated behind his desk who was obviously in charge. Mustering her courage she took a breath, then stepped forward and bobbed a small curtsy to the man, as she straightened up she said, Good morning Hokage sir, my name is Elsa of Arendelle. The Hokage gave her a kind grandfatherly smile as he responded, and good morning to you young one, my name is Hiruzen Siratobi. It is so nice to see someone come into my office and show this old man some respect for a change. As he said the last party motion so it was obvious that he was speaking about the white-haired man that Elsa had been traveling with, the small barb and Jurea overreacting gasp caused Elsa to giggle a little, and she seemed to relax. Focusing again on Jurea the Hokage said so Jurea, why have you brought this charming young lady to our village that is so far away from her home and family? Leaning again on wall Jurea said back, well as I was saying in the land of Arendelle, where the trolls have taken up residence there is no chakra. However by some twist of fate it seems someone in their kingdom has been born with a spontaneous bloodline limit and abnormally high chakra reserves, and she is standing before you. Upon hearing this the Hokage turned his focus back to the little girl and said in a gentle voice, if that is true, then Elsa would you mind showing me a small demonstration of your ability. As soon as he said it Elsa's nerves came back full force. She almost seemed to attempt to fold in on herself trying to disappear. When he say this the old man stood from his desk and went to stand by the small girl. Crouching down so that he was closer to her level, he placed a comforting hand on her shoulder and said again as grandfatherly as he could manage, it is okay little one, you don't have to feel pressured or nervous. I just want to see a small display of what you can do, it doesn't have to be grand. 
When he had placed his hand on her shoulder she initially stiffened, but as he gently spoke, she again relaxed at his words and the caring air he seemed to give off. With another breath to gather her courage she said in a small voice, okay, but please stand back, it can be a little dangerous. After giving the girl's shoulder one last comforting squeeze the old man stood up and went to stand next to his student. When he was standing far enough away Elsa hesitantly removed her gloves and stretched out her hands, she seemed to concentrate for a moment before icy blue energy shot suddenly from her fingertips, forming a pile of snow directly in front of the door to his office. Upon seeing the young girl's ability the two men were shocked, she had used chakra without the need for hand signs, and not only that, but she had manipulated a sub-element without hand signs. Such a feat normally could only be accomplished if the user was a jonin of the highest caliber, who had spent years of study and training, perfecting their chakra control. To see a mere child do such a thing was amazing even for the two experienced ninja. Suddenly, as the office was blanketed by a stunned silence, the door was kicked open and in walked a surprise visitor. Unfortunately for the new arrival as he entered the room he ended up walking right into the unexpected snowdrift that was located in the middle of his path. A surprise obstacle caused him to trip and fall directly into the pile, and when he raised himself out of the snow, he found himself encased in whiteness. The three occupants of the room now stared in shock at the snow-covered intruder. After a while Hirazin addressed the impromptu snowman and said excuse me, but who are you and why are you here? With a shout of indignation the short white figure began to vigorously shake, freeing himself from the snow and revealing the form of the short blonde boy that Elsa and Jureya had seen on the way to the Hukage's tower. With an angry and slightly hurt look in his eyes the boy pointed at the old man and shouted, how can you say that old man, first you set this pile of cold white stuff in the middle of the floor so that I trip in it, then you pretend like you don't even recognize me? That is a low blow gramps, is this because of that time that I glued your window open and stole all of your paperweights? At hearing this the old man suddenly rushed forward at startling speed and grabbed the young boy by the arms and lifting him up. What? He yelled, that was you, the entire day's paperwork got mixed up because of that, and a team of secretaries and I had to spend hours getting it all back in order. Naruto if you ever try anything like that again I will hang you up by your thumbs from the Hokage monument. Naruto grinned sheepishly at the older man and said, did I say that was me, I am sure there are tons of other people it could have been. The Hokage didn't even respond, he just dropped the boy on his rear end and gave him a sharp bop on the head, before he turned back to his desk and began to head for his chair. As he made the short trip the boy finally noticed the other occupants of the room and observed them for a bit before turning to his grandpa in all but blood and said, hey gramps, what's with the white-haired weirdo and the princess in your office? The comment got a mixed response, the Hokage chuckled to himself, Jurea's eye began to twitch in irritation, and Elsa began to get a slightly worried expression on her face as she wondered what had given away her social status to the boy. Nonchalantly the Hokage responded, they are guests Naruto, be respectful and introduce yourself. As he said the last party gave the boy a pointed look. If you try anything with either of them, so help me, I will find a way to outlaw Raymond in the whole of fire country. When he said that the boy shot to his feet and bowed respectfully. Greetings and welcome to Konoha. My name is Naruto Uzumaki and I am pleased to meet you. He blurted out in a rush. Elsa was slightly taken aback by the sudden turn that the boy's demeanor had taken. After he introduced himself he straightened up and turned to the old man sitting behind the desk. There is that better? He asked. Yes, much better. Replied the Hokage. Bid said the boy as he bounced up and sat on the edge of the desk, now that, that is out of the way. Why do you have a weird old man and a princess in your office? The comment warranted a muffled chuckle from the Hokage, as well as another twitch in the brow of Jiraiya. Finally after losing his patience at the boy's cheek the spymaster marched up to the boy and got right in his face before saying. Now you listen here you brat, I will have you know that I am not just some spiky haired weirdo. Naruto backed up nervously after seeing the ire in the large man's eyes. Okay then, the boy hesitantly asked, who are you? Suddenly the white-haired man leapt away from the boy and everything seemed to get darker before a spotlight appeared from nowhere illuminating him in a dramatic light. I am known by many names. Jiraiya began dramatically as drums started playing in the background, to some I am known as the unstoppable madman of peace. To others I am merely known as the white shadow of justice. All throughout the elemental nations men fear me and women yearn to know me. I am the great toad sage, the gallant Jiraiya. As he finished his ridiculous introduction he stuck a kabuki pose with his hand outstretched toward the little boy and a smug look on his face at the shocked look on the boys. After taking a moment to recover from the experience Naruto turned back to the Hokage, I was wrong Gramps, he isn't a weirdo. He said. The Hokage had a puzzled and slightly worried expression on his face as he heard the boy's statement. Silently he prayed that Naruto would not seek to emulate his students' odd quirks. No, continued Naruto, he is a super mega weirdo. Get him away from me. 
As fast as he could Naruto scrambled behind the seat of the Hokage in an attempt to separate himself from the strange man that had apparently traumatized him. Jirei after seeing the boy's reaction began to crouch in the corner with a dark cloud over his head while he muttered to himself about how no one liked his cool introductions and how he wasn't a weirdo. After witnessing the strange behavior of everyone in the office, it finally became too much for Elsa and she broke out into giggles at the silliness around her. The Hokage gained a soft smile as he heard the tinkling sound of her voice and Naruto peeked around the chair to look at where the sound was coming from. When he saw Elsa laughing his head popped completely out from behind the chair and a megawatt smile stretched across his face as he began to giggle along with her. Suddenly he ran around the desk until he was in front of the girl and introduced himself yet again. Hi, he said as he extended his hand for her to shake, my name is Naruto Uzumaki and I am going to be the Hokage one day, want to be friends. Elsa looked from the outstretched hand to the smiling face of the boy who was looking at her hopefully. After a moment of deliberation Elsa finally smiled back at Naruto and grabbed his hand to return the handshake. Hello, she responded politely, my name is Elsa of Arendelle, I am here to join the academy, and yes, I would like to be friends. When he heard her response his smile seemed to multiply in intensity, though it would seem to be impossible with how brightly he was smiling already. Then suddenly he tightened his grip on her hand and turned to the Hokage, who was still sitting behind his desk, watching the exchange between the two children, with a subdued yet genuine smile, and said, Hey Gramps the princess and I are going to go play. Before he began to drag the young girl toward the door. Elsa however, not being someone who particularly enjoyed being dragged about by someone she had just met, even if they had decided to be friends, dug in her heels, halting their progress towards the door. Wait Naruto, she said I don't know if I am done talking to the Hokage yet. Elsa may have been young, but one of the first lessons in etiquette she had been taught by her parents was that you don't barge out on someone when you were doing business with them. The Hokage's subtle smile widened slightly at seeing the young girl's excellent manners before he said, Oh don't worry Elsa, Jiraiya, and I will be able to settle all of the other details, I think it would be a wonderful idea if Naruto showed you around the town. I will send someone for you later who will show you where you will be living while you stay here and explain to you the academy schedule that you will be starting in a few days. See, said Naruto, I knew it would be fine if we left, you worry too much princess. Turning to face the energetic boy Elsa's curiosity finally made her ask him, Naruto, why do you keep calling me a princess? We just met so for all you know I could just be a merchant's daughter. Naruto looked at her for a second, then he pointed to the Hokage, I know you are a princess because Gramps told me a story once where it talked about how the princess was the prettiest girl in all the land and you are the prettiest girl that I have ever met, so therefore you must be a princess. Now let's go. After he answered her he grabbed her hand and again rushed out the door. He was so excited that he didn't notice the blush that spread across Elsa's face, nor the loud laugh that was echoing in the office from the Hokage at hearing his response. As the door closed behind the two children, the Hokage's laughter settled down to a soft chuckle. He went to pick up the next piece of paper in his inbox when he looked to his student who had calmed down and stopped his moping in the corner. So he asked what do you think of your first meeting with your godson? The large white-haired man smirked as he replied, he is like a mini Kashina wrapped up in Minato's skin. The comment elicited another small chuckle from the aged village leader. Truer words were never spoken. He said. Looking up from the papers in front of him he eyed his student. Does this mean you will be stopping by the village more often so that you can check on our little guest? Yeah answered the toad sage, this way he will at least begin to recognize my face. Maybe I will be able to teach him a thing or two while I am here as well. Oh, planning on training another Hokage are you? questioned the older man. No way, if he wants that position he will have to earn it on his own merits just like his father did. But I may teach him how to mingle with the fairer sex. Did you hear that last line? If he can come up with things like that on the fly, then with a little coaching he could be a regular Casanova when he gets older. Jurei responded. Well good luck with that, Hiruzen said sarcastically, just remember that if you corrupt him in any way, then I am fairly certain that Kishina will find some way to come back from the grave so that she can kill you herself. After hearing that Jiraiya blanched at the thought and began to revise his plans for the time he would be spending with his godson in the future. After all no sense in tempting fate. Elsa was at first overwhelmed slightly at the energy that her new friend was showing. As soon as they had made it out of building he had taken of in, what was to her, a random direction. All the while keeping her hand firmly in a death grip, almost as if he feared she would vanish if he let go. Slow down Naruto, she desperately said, I can't go that fast. When he heard her Naruto immediately began to go at a slightly more sedate pace and looked back at her with an abashed look on his face. Sorry Elsa, I didn't mean to go too fast for you. He said. It's alright, she said back, where are we going? When she asked that Naruto's face lit up again and he said, we are going to this park that I really like. It has tons of fun games and equipment to play on, but a lot of them take two people, so I have never tried them before. 
After explaining where their destination would be, he began to head for the park again, only this time he made sure to go at a speed he could see that Elsa was comfortable at. Elsa just smiled because the innocent energy that seemed to radiate off of Naruto reminded her of her sister back at home when they used to play together. Unfortunately at the thought of her sister, she remembered how they had not parted on the best of term. Then she started to think of the rest of her family, and as her thoughts began to head down that rabbit hole she began to get homesick. Naruto began to notice that she was slowing down slightly and looked back to see if he was going too fast for her again. However as he looked back he didn't notice the figure stepping out in front of him, which caused a collision bringing all three of them down to the dirt. Naruto was the first to recover from the accident, he bounced up and quickly went to his new friend's side, a panicked worried expression on his face, as he thought of how if she was hurt, she wouldn't want to be his friend anymore. The next person to recover was the figure that they had run into. He turned out to also be a child of the same age as Naruto and Elsa. As he got up he rubbed his hand through his black hair, looking for any bumps that might be forming. After the pain in his body began to recede, it was replaced by a strong feeling of anger and indignation that someone had run into him. Standing up he looked around for the culprits who he spied on the ground nearby. When he saw that it was a pair of kids his age his anger intensified that they would do this to him, after all he had been taught by his father that he was someone who should command respect from those who were his same age, especially because he was about to start the academy and high expectations had been placed on his shoulders. So he stood up and began to stalk over to the children who had hit him. Hey. He began angrily, who do you think you are running into me like that you could have seriously hurt me? Naruto, who was more worried about his friend at the moment, merely waved his hand dismissively at the disdainful remark. After all he had heard harsher things from other villagers, and he could tell that the speaker was a kid like him from them voice. The black-haired boy however did not take kindly to being dismissed so nonchalantly by some nobody who he had never met so he reached down, grabbed the blonde boy's shoulder, and yanked him around so that they were face to face. Do you know who I am? The boy asked, now Naruto was angry, he was trying to take care of his new friend, and some random kid was getting all up in his face about something that was clearly an accident. So he responded in kind by roughly pushing the other boy's hand off of his shoulder and saying, oh sorry, I didn't realize we were playing the ask questions that no one cares about game. Here let me go next, do you like apples? The black haired boy bristled at the mocking tone that the blonde responded with. His dark eyes lit up with even more anger, and he said right back, my name is Sasuke Chia. I am part of the ancient and noble clan of the Achiha, and you will give me proper respect. Respect is something you gotta earn, replied Naruto, and right now the only thing you are earning from me is more anger. As the two boys were arguing Elsa began to get her wits back about her. Luckily the collision had knocked her out of the funk that she had been putting herself into. As she shook her head to get the spots out of her vision, she began to take note of the argument happening near her. Looking up her eyes focused in on the image of her new friend, arguing with a black-haired boy that she had never seen before. Finally the words they were speaking to each other registered, and she saw that if nothing happened then a fight would break out soon. So never being one to stay idle she stood up and collected herself before walking up to the arguing duo. What are you two arguing about? She asked in a crisp tone. The two boys turned to the sound of the voice to see who had interrupted their argument. Which by then had devolved into Sasuke calling Naruto stupid in a few colorful ways, and Naruto telling Sasuke that he was a stuck-up jerk. Upon seeing his friend up and okay Naruto's face instantly brightened with a smile. Elsa? He exclaimed, I am so glad you are alright. Yes Naruto, I am fine. Now why are you fighting with this guy? Sasuke, upon seeing what he thought of as reinforcements for his current verbal adversary, gathered himself and put the haughtiest look on his face that he could, in the hopes of cowing them both with his superiority. Listen here girl. He said to Elsa, you can just stay out of this, it is between me and the root urchin here. As soon as the words registered in her mind Elsa's eyes narrowed dangerously. Here was a boy trying to use an air of superiority on her when she was a princess. She had been taught how to impress people with her presence, since she could walk from her mother, who could have a room of dignitaries bowing and apologizing to her from a displeased glance. Elsa herself had suffered under her gaze in the past due to reckless adventures with her sister, so if this boy thought he could overpower her, he had another thing coming. Excuse me boy. Elsa responded, focusing every ounce of her displeasure on the black-haired boy. But I have every right to come to the defense of my friend, especially if his only fault happened to be an accident. I now Sasuke was nearly shaking in fear at the presence of the girl in front of him. For some reason he couldn't understand as she looked at him, it felt like he was in front of his mother for stealing his brother's kunai to practice with again. She seemed to radiate an air of superiority that outclassed his own by a mile and made him feel like angering her would be the worst mistake of his life. When she saw the boy begin to back down, she turned to her friend, who was staring at her awestruck by the impressive aura, and said, come on Naruto let's go play like we had planned. 
And with that she walked off in the direction that they had been going in before the crash, fully expecting her friend to follow her, which he did of course. As they walked away Sasuke was stuck in the same place he had been shocked at how Elsa had affected him like that. Whoa, she is really scary. He thought to himself before continuing on his way toward his house. When Naruto had caught up to his friend he ran in front of her before stopping. At first Elsa was confused why they were stopped and thought that maybe she had been going the wrong way. Then suddenly his eyes seemed to sign like stars as he looked at her with adoration. That was awesome. He exclaimed, how did you do that? What are you talking about? Elsa asked shyly. That thing you did when you looked at him and then he was all scared and stuff. He clarified, I was arguing with him forever and all he did was call me dumb. But you just gave him a stink eye and he clammed up just like that. Elsa was shocked at the way her friend described what had happened. She hadn't given the boy a stink eye had she? Turning to her friend with a confused look on her face and told him so. I didn't give him a stink eye. I just told him the truth, he shouldn't act like that to people he doesn't know. I have seen my mom do the same thing to a lot of people who are being rude, so I just copied her. Oh, Naruto said back, that makes sense. You are a princess so your mom must be a queen, so she would know how to do that kind of thing. Elsa sighed at his constant insistence that she was a princess, even though it was supposed to be a secret. After trying to think about how she should respond, she decided to just stay silent instead of validating the statement with a response. Whatever Naruto, let's just go to the park you were talking about okay? Elsa finally said. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, Naruto responded excitedly, and with that he grabbed her hand once more, and they were once again speeding toward their destination. Laughter rang through the air as children ran about playing in the park. There weren't many possibly five or six, but with it being a smaller park, it felt a bit more crowded than it was. As Elsa and Naruto approached it however, he began to slow, eventually bringing Elsa to a stop beside him as he looked nervously at the park. Oh no, he said, I didn't think it would be so full. Elsa looked at him questioningly. It's fine, she said, we can wait for some of the equipment to free up. Maybe we can join one of the games they are playing on the grass. Naruto seemed to sigh as he mumbled out, it won't matter they aren't going to let us play. All Elsa could do was stare at him longer confused at his current attitude. On the way here he had been ecstatic about the prospect of playing at the park yet now that they had arrived, he seemed to lose all of the excitement he had literally seconds ago. Suddenly his head shot up and he looked off into the distance, as though he had heard a noise in the distance. Did you hear that? He said. No, responded Elsa, what are you talking about? Come on, quick. Naruto exclaimed as he began to run off towards a grove of trees near the park. Elsa struggled to keep up, but even with her skirt hiked up so she could run easier, he quickly outran her. Luckily she didn't lose sight of him as he entered the trees, though only just. She began to hear him yelling, and by the time she arrived at the small clearing all she saw was her friend standing off against a group of three older boys. Going to be Hokage, you think I would just walk away when someone needs my help. She heard the end of Naruto's proclamation as she walked up. As she approached she made a small crinkling sound as she stepped on some leaves, bringing the attention of the three older boys to her. As she surveyed the scene that she had come upon Naruto quickly peeked over his shoulder to see who had come up behind him. Elsa quick, he cried, get the girl away from them while I hold them off. Upon hearing the mention of a girl Elsa focused her attention to the spot behind the bullies and spotted a girl who was around their age with short hair that appeared black under the shadows of the leaves. When the three boys heard Naruto's bold declaration, all they did was begin to laugh uproariously. How do you expect to hold off all three of us at once? The largest one in the middle rebutted. Elsa had begun to edge her way around the confrontation, and as such she saw a smirk begin to form on Naruto's face as he brought his hands together, keeping the middle and pointer fingers of his hands extended. Elsa was confused by the gesture momentarily until she looked at the faces of the three opponents of her friend. When they saw the way Naruto was holding his hands they were shocked, almost fearful. Ah that's impossible. One of them said in disbelief, you aren't even in the academy yet, you can't know a technique like that. Naruto held the smirk on his face as he looked at the boys. Before his face began to wrinkle as if he were trying to lift some large weight and he suddenly shouted, clone technique. A large plume of smoke suddenly erupted from the ground in front of Naruto, blanketing the area in a white fog. When it cleared standing in front of Naruto was a sickly pale imitation of the boy, it seemed to stagger for a while, almost like it was attempting to stand in front of the boy who had conjured it, but after a few moments it seemed to collapse on itself almost like a puppet that had its strings cut. The bullies when they had witnessed the pitiful and slightly disturbing display of power from the boy who was opposing them, began to let out sniggers and giggles which soon evolved into full-blown laughter. You expect to be Hokage, but can't even make a clone. One said in between his bouts of mirth. All three soon began to take up the taunting when suddenly they heard a cry of, distraction success. Then before they realized it Naruto had tackled the boy in the middle and began to wail on his face with his small hands balled into fists. 
Elsa quick get her out of here. Naruto called before he was overrun by his victim's two friends. With three older boys fighting one small adversary the fight shouldn't have lasted long, but Naruto was relentless in his assault. Every time he fell he would pull himself back up and attack one of the boys, prompting the others to pull him off their friend, and the beating would begin anew. Luckily when Elsa heard the order at the beginning of the fight, she refocused herself and made a dash at the small girl that Naruto was trying to help. Grabbing her head Elsa began to pull her off into the trees a short ways so that they could hide themselves behind a bush. They were far enough away that the bullies wouldn't find them, but they could still see what was happening in the fight vaguely. Elsa watched horrified as she saw her new friend give it his all until he fell down from a punch delivered by the largest boy, and this time he stayed down. All three boys by the end were panting hard and had several bruises, scratches and even a few bite marks. So in the end they decided to wander off to the homes to get treated for their wounds. As they headed off in the opposite direction Elsa stayed hidden until she was sure they had left to make sure that the girl and herself would be safe so that the fight that Naruto had just been through wouldn't be in vain. Just as she was about to leave cover to check on her friend however there was noise from the forest behind her. Fearing that the three boys had returned she turned around and clung to the girl she had pulled to safety, determined to keep her from harm. Her nervousness slightly diminished however when an adult with short brown hair wearing a black kimono with a white border emerged from the bushes behind them. Lady Hinata. He cried, as soon as he caught sight of the two girls, why did you run off like that, you could have been hurt. Suddenly Elsa grabbed his attention in the hopes of getting help for her friend, sir, I am happy you're here. My friend needs help. Elsa said, pointing toward the clearing where Naruto lay on the ground. The man followed her finger to look where she had pointed, when he caught sight of the boy lying there however his eyes narrowed slightly before he said, Lady Hinata, we need to go your father expected us back 15 minutes ago. As he reached for the girl, Elsa had a look of disbelief at the attitude he had toward her friend. What are you doing she demanded my friend needs help. She demanded. You shouldn't be around him. He is a bad influence. He simply stated. Then as he began to walk away Elsa felt a hand grasp her wrist. Turning she looked into the eyes of the girl and saw that she seemed to plead for Elsa to come with her. Elsa was torn between two choices then. On one hand her friend was lying hurt in the clearing in front of them, while on the other the look in the girl's eyes could only be described as pitiful as they pleaded for her to stay. As she was torn by indecision the choice was made for her when she felt a tug and began walking behind the man who was holding the other hand of the girl that she had helped rescue. As she walked away the only thing she could think of was to apologize to her friend, I am sorry Naruto. She thought. A few minutes later Elsa found herself seated on a cushion in a large office across from a stern man with long black hair and an imposing presence that Elsa recognized instantly as the heir of nobility, having been surrounded by nobles nearly her whole life, but the most unnerving thing about him were his piercing wide eyes. When Elsa had first met the girl that she now knew as Hinata, she hadn't taken a very long time to look at her, so she hadn't noticed her eyes right away, but when the little group she was a part of had entered into the large compound that was apparently Hinata's family home, she couldn't help but notice that nearly everyone who lived inside the walls had the same blank eyes that had only slight variation in color from person to person. So, began the man, at the sound of his Elsa's attention was instantly pulled back to the here and now. You are telling me that you lost track of my daughter after you had been tasked with being her bodyguard. As he said this the man's eyes never left the table in front of him, yet it still felt as if he was watching each of the people before him individually. Yes Lord Hiashi, the man who had led them here answered as he bowed deeply before the family head. I am sorry that I let this happen and I beg your forgiveness. Don't be mad at Ko, please father. Hinata suddenly interjected on the behalf of her protector, it isn't his fault, I snuck away while he wasn't looking, because I wanted to visit the nearby park. She immediately settled down however, as soon as her father fixed his eyes on her with a disapproving glare for having interrupted. Then he raised his eyebrow questioningly and said to his daughter, Oh really, tell me then how is it that you can't seem to perform the gentle fist correctly, yet you have the skill needed to evade one of the best chunin in our household. Anada flinched at the tone he used when he described her less than satisfactory progress when it came to their family's fighting style. Elsa on the other hand was getting uncomfortable with how the meeting was going. She decided to try and defend her new acquaintance, she didn't really know her well enough to consider her a friend yet, and she voiced her opinion. Excuse me sir, Elsa began, I don't think you should really be getting mad at your daughter, it isn't her fault that she got bullied while she was away from her guard. Isn't it? Replied Hiashi, tell me, Hinata, why you allowed yourself to be belittled in such a manner by these three children. Even with your mediocre skill you should have been able to stand up to three untrained civilians. But it was my fault, replied Hinata in a small voice, I ran into them and they dropped their ice cream because of me. Oh? Replied Hiashi, with a small amount of heat in his voice, so you are telling me that a scoop of ice cream is the price that you put on the honor of your house and name. 
Never mind all of the people who gave their lives to protect the honor of our house. You think that the loss of a small treat is enough of a reason to allow someone to look down on you. Oh, please if you would take Hinata to get changed. She obviously needs more practice in her skills. So perhaps an hour of practice before dinner will help her to learn something from today's experience. Hinata and Ko merely bowed their heads at the order and began to leave the room to comply with the order they had been given. As Elsa began to stand to leave as well Hiashi suddenly addressed her. I am sorry miss, but if you would spare a small amount of time I would like to speak to you briefly. Elsa was surprised at how he addressed her, but nevertheless she settled back down. When the door was closed. Hiashi asked a question that she wasn't expecting. Tell me miss, he said, what do you think of my daughter? Elsa was a little confused at the question at first, but she had been taught how to speak to nobles for the past few years, and the first rule that her mother had told her was, if all else fails tell them the straight truth and go from there. So following that guideline she told the man in front of her exactly what she thought. She seems very nice, but she is a bit too shy for her own good, and she lets people walk over her. The Ashi seemed almost pleased by the response so while she was telling the truth, she decided to add another comment. I do think however that you weren't right with how you talked to her. My parents also taught me things like what you told her today, but they were never cruel, and that is what you were. At the second comment Hiashi's face dropped the pleased look that he had after her first comment and became an emotionless mask. At first Elsa feared that she had messed up and only made him angry at her. Then he seemed to lose some of the tension he had and began to speak in a calm voice. Lady Elsa, he began, I know that you are not from Kanoha originally, so let me explain something for you. At the admittance that he knew of her origins, Elsa began to get nervous at what would come next. He actually seeing the nerves in his young guest, sought to soothe her worries by saying. Please calm down, the reason I know of your origins is because the Hokage sent out a message to the ninja in the village that told us you would be staying with us for a while, and that should you need help that we should offer it to you. Elsa seemed to relax a little bit at his words, so he continued with his previous thought. Now as I was saying, he continued, as you are not from Kanoha I understand that you are not familiar with our way of life, so let me ask you something. Hinata is 8 years old right now, but what will happen when she turns 12? Elsa thought about the question for a while before answering that she wasn't sure. When she turns 12, he continued, she will become a ninja, she will be thrust into a world of intrigue and danger, where she will face many opponents that may outnumber or may be stronger than her. As such everything I do is in the hope that when she faces odds that seem overwhelming, she will be strong enough to face and overcome them so that she can come home alive. That is all that is important to me, I care not whether she loves me or hates me, as long as she comes back after every mission. Elsa was speechless for a while upon hearing what the man had said. After thinking for a while she asked, then why not just keep her from being a ninja? Because it is her dream to be one. Answered Hiashi, ever since she was small she has dreamed of being a ninja. So I will push until either that dream becomes reality or she gains a new dream. But, he continued, that isn't why I wanted to speak to you. Elsa was confused again at the jump in conversation until she remembered that they had gotten sidetracked after her second comment after his initial question about his daughter. I would like you to befriend my daughter and help her. The man suddenly asked as he bowed slightly to her showing that he was sincere in his request. What do you mean? Questioned Elsa, how can I help her? As you said before, responded Hiashi, Hinata has a problem with being too shy and humble when dealing with others. You however as I have seen know how to be strong and bold without being overbearing to those you speak with. I feel that you could help Hinata to understand when it is the right time to yield and when it is the right time to stand her ground. Elsa couldn't say that she understood what he had meant completely, but she had understood the basic idea of what Hinata's father had asked her. After giving it some thought she finally gave Hiashi her answer. I think it would be wonderful to have another friend here in Kanoha, so I would be honored to be your daughters. She said with a smile. Hiashi merely nodded as he gave his thanks. You will be welcome here anytime, just give your name to the guard and tell them you are here to see Hinata, they will tell you where to go. He said, he finished the small meeting between them by asking her, now, would you like to stay for dinner or do you need to go? As Elsa pondered the answer she would give the image of a blonde-haired boy lying down in the woods flashed through her mind. Suddenly overcome with guilt at having nearly forgotten about him, Elsa politely declined the dinner invitation and said that she could find her own way out. Later as she passed through a courtyard toward the gate she happened to pass by a large building with paper wall that were slid open to reveal the inside to be a single large room with a polished wooden floor where inside a now familiar girl happened to be practicing a set of stances and movements. When Elsa came into view she heard his gasp and a hurried request for a break, when she had turned to the noise she saw Hinata hurrying toward her with apprehension in her eyes. When she was close enough she began to ask in her quiet voice, what happened? He didn't get mad at you did he? Will I get to see you again? Elsa just smiled at her new friend and said, no, he actually said that I could come over anytime to spend time with you if I wanted. 
Inada was in shock, it almost sounded like her father had been kind to the girl in front of her, something she had never thought her father would be capable of. However instead of fixating on it, Hinata decided to just be happy about the outcome. I am glad, Hinata stammered out, I was worried he would have been upset that you had saved me with your friend, instead of leaving me to get myself out of the trouble I was in. Elsa smiled and said back, two don't think even your father would be upset that someone helped his daughter. However I would like to say that you shouldn't have allowed those boys to treat you that way. Nothing is worth letting yourself be humiliated, especially not the loss of an ice cream. Anada shrunk back a little at the comment that Elsa had given her, fearing that her new friend would think she was useless like her family did. Elsa however when she saw Hinata react that way decided to take different approach with the shy girl. Hinata, listen, I can tell by your home that your family must be some this important for this village, right? Elsa asked. Hinata was a little confused at the question, but she answered, yes, she said, the Hyuga clan is one of the two largest clans in the village. Elsa nodded as she heard the answer, before continuing, all right then, as such you being a member of this clan means that you have a responsibility to the citizens of Kanoha. Anada became even more confused when she heard this, she had never been told of any responsibility she had just from being a member of her family, but Elsa seemed to know what she was talking about, so she asked her to continue. Because you are from such an important family, Elsa said, people will look up to you as an example of how they should act. It is your responsibility to be the best example you can be, and what kind of example are you being when allow yourself to be degraded just because you happen to bump into someone on accident. Being from an important family doesn't make you better than other people, but it does mean that you need to represent your family well. Hanada was shocked, she had never thought about it that way, nor been taught that philosophy. But hearing it from Elsa a lot of the lessons on poise that she was made to learn made much more sense. Elsa having said her piece, bid farewell to the girl with a promise to visit another day. As she walked away and Hinata returned to her practice neither of them noticed a man standing around the corner from where they had been talking. As Elsa left he as she couldn't help the small smile that touched his lips. He knew that the new addition to Kanoha would have a marvelous influence on his daughter. As Elsa entered the small apartment that she was given a key for she couldn't help the small feeling of sadness that crept into her heart. After she had left the Hyuga estate she had been a little lost on where to go until suddenly a woman with long purple hair and a white mask painted with a cat-like face seemed to appear before her. She had introduced herself as Nico and told Elsa that she had been assigned by the Hokage to be her personal guide while she was in the village. Elsa had immediately identified her as some kind of bodyguard, her demeanor reminding Elsa greatly of the royal guard that was an almost constant presence in the castle. When she told Elsa she was to be her guide Elsa asked to be taken to the park. When Nico asked her which park she meant however Elsa was lost on what to tell her, she hadn't been in the park long enough to remember any identifying landmarks, and Naruto had lead them to the park too quickly for her to remember the route they had taken. Upon realizing that finding the exact park where she had left her first friend behind was impossible, she amended her request to being led to the Hokage's tower instead. Nico nodded her head in affirmation before asking permission to touch Elsa's shoulder, claiming that she could get them there much faster. Elsa gave her consent and as the woman gently but firmly grabbed her, she was told to close her eyes and relax. Suddenly she felt a quick breeze and an instant of weightlessness before the hand left her shoulder, and she was told to reopen her eyes. When she did she was amazed to see that they were already in front of the large red building that held the office of the village leader. Elsa's mouth dropped open in shock before she turned to the older woman and asked how are we back here so fast. Nico merely seemed to brush it off and told her that it was a skill that nearly every ninja learned after they had been working for a while. Elsa accepted the answer but still said, it doesn't make it less impressive to someone who has never seen anything like it before. After their small banter the two entered the building and made their way to the office of the Hokage, where they were greeted to the side of Harrison and Jurea seated together on the couches in the room and sharing stories of the time they had been separated. When Elsa entered the room however their conversation was cut short in order to address the young girl. The Hokage smiled warmly at the girl as he spoke to her. So I have heard that you had quite the adventure on your first day here. He commented. What? Questioned Elsa, how could you know what I did after I left? The Hokage just chuckled and fixed his hat on his head so that it sit a bit more comfortably on his head, not so that it would cover his eyes and add an air of mystery, as he said, not much happens in my village that I don't hear about, my dear. Bireya nearly scoffed at the antics of his teacher. He may be considered overly dramatic by many, but he learned most of his quirks from the man that was sitting beside him. In the hopes of sparing the poor girl any more headache, the tall white-haired man stood from the couch and said to his charge. Enough with the old man's games, it is getting late, and I think that it would be wise to get you moved into where you will be living for the time you will be staying here. Elsa nodded to what the man had said, but interjected before they could leave the office, excuse me, but before we go would it be possible for me to see Naruto again? We kind of got separated from each other earlier, and I wanted to apologize to him. 
Garrison's heart was warmed to see someone worried about the well-being of his pseudo-grandson. It was a big improvement to the complete avoidance that most villagers gave him. The Hokage spent all of the time that he could with him, but just one man with an incredibly busy schedule wasn't able to give the boy all of the attention that he deserved, so to see another person who he could count on to be there for Naruto was a welcome change. Don't worry, he answered, tomorrow is your first day at the academy, and I am sure that you will have the chance to meet with him then. Now go get settled in so that you can get a good night's rest. Elsa was a little disappointed that she couldn't see Naruto that night, but she could see the sense in what the Hokage was saying. The sun was already beginning to approach the horizon, so if the failed to go no then she would be unpacking in the dark. In that case I thank you for the wonderful welcome I have received, and I look forward to the future I will have here, Elsa said in farewell. So here she stood looking around the apartment as Jureya followed her inside. The apartment consisted of three rooms, a main room that they had walked into worked as a living room kitchen combo. In the back there was a hallway that was between two rooms, a bedroom was to the right while to left there was a simple bathroom. She was initially confused by some of the technology that could be found in the apartment, but after a few simple explanations she was amazed at what they could do. For example she could light an entire room by simply flipping a switch on the wall, while at the castle they had to use gas or oil lamps. Also the kitchens at the castle had ice boxes with actual ice in them, while well, this one seemed to stay cold almost magically. I am guessing by the look on your face that there are a lot of new things that you have never seen before. Jurea suddenly stated. Yes said Elsa with a look of childlike wonder on her face, how did you build all of this stuff it is incredible. Well, with the use of chakra and seals our culture was able to make many advancements in our knowledge of how nature works. As such we were able to build the technology that you see around you. Answered Jurea. Enough about that stuff though. Jurea continued, you will learn more about that as you go through your classes. We need to get you things out so you can get all settled. Reaching behind his back Jurea pulled out a scroll that he placed on the ground in front of him. Putting his thumb in his mouth he bit down hard enough to draw a small amount of blood before he wiped it on the writing in the scroll on the ground, and in a puff of smoke, two rather large trunks appeared. I took the liberty of giving the gold that you father sent with you to the Hokage, so that he could keep it safe. Every month he will give you an amount of cash so you can buy what you need, should you need extra money one month you can ask him for it, and he will give it to you. Your father sent plenty of gold for you to live on during your time here. Also I had him send out some people to do some preemptive shopping, so your fridge and shelves should be filled with food. Running to the kitchen Elsa looked and found her cupboards to be holding plenty of food to last her one week maybe two. When she saw that what he had said was true she thanked him for his thoughtfulness. Now, said Jurea, the trolls gave this to me before we left so that I could give it to you. Reaching into his coat he pulled out another scroll though this one had a slightly different design. Handing the scroll to Elsa, she slowly rolled it open to see a small set of instruction, telling her to open the scroll completely and placing it on the ground. With her curiosity sparked she complied with the instructions before a small pop was heard and a cloud of smoke appeared out of the scroll. When it cleared standing in the room with the two humans was a troll who stood just a few inches shorter to Elsa did. Ooh, finally child. Said the troll, I have been waiting for you to call me all day so that we could meet each other. After her initial statement, for the voice showed that the troll was a female, she walked toward Elsa and took both of her hands into her much larger stone ones. Her hand may have been made of stone, but they didn't feel rough like gravel, they had a more smooth texture similar to the feeling of river rock. It was obvious that the troll was older due to the slight weathering that was on her face. But she just seemed to exude a warm homey feel, and the way she looked at Elsa made her feel like she was safe and cared for. My name is Greta Child, the troll introduced herself, I am here to help you out while you are away from your family. I will be here to cook you meals and keep you tidy, and if you want to send any letters home, just give them to me, and when I travel back to Arendelle, I will make sure they get to the royals. As soon as she heard that she would be able to stay in contact with her family through letters Elsa felt a wave of relief rush over. She tightened her grip on the troll's comforting hand and fought back tears as she thanked the kind troll caretaker. Now, now, don't cry child, said the troll, I am sure you will gain control of your powers very soon and you will return to you home sooner than you think. Hearing those words helped Elsa to relax further and calm herself down. Good job Elsa, said the troll, you are already on your way to controlling your powers if you are controlling your emotions so well. Anyway, since you aren't a summoner of our clan yet, you won't be able to summon any troll you want, but all you need to do to summon me here is place this scroll on the ground and touch this rune here with your power. As she explained this she pointed to a particular rune on the scroll. What that will do is tell me you need help and I will hurry here as fast as I can okay. Elsa just smiled and thanked Greta for all of her help. As Greta helped her to get settled in Jurea took his leave and promised Elsa to check in frequently to make sure she was alright. Late that night after, a meal cooked by Greta and having put all of her clothes away, Elsa was being tucked into bed. 
Jiraiya had told her that someone would be by in the morning to take her to school, so it was important that she was rested and ready by the time she had to leave for school. Greta was still there with her humming a soothing tune. And as she drifted off to sleep she thought about all of the things she had done today. As her mind raced through all of the new experiences and things that she had learned, she couldn't help the ball of fear that had found its way into her stomach. Then suddenly her thoughts strayed toward the new friend she had made, Naruto with his brilliant exuberance, Hinata with her shy kindness, and Greta who exuded a maternal warmth. As she thought of them she realized that even though it was all new she wasn't alone, and that thought gave her the final comfort that she needed to fall into a deep sleep. The bee continued. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.